another English language A-level video with me, Paul, uh, from QE Darlington. And this one is a second video, which is about the language investigation. We start off with a plea that you brush off the old AQA English language textbook and uh, have a read of the section that's about the language investigation. So it's round about the 230s in terms of pages. It talks you through what the investigation is. It talks you through how you might go about choosing an area to investigate and the approaches that you take. OK, so have a read. Um, OK, the secret of getting ahead is getting started, says Mark Twain. He can always be counted on for a good quotation, along with Maya Angelou, Winston Churchill and Oscar Wilde. So let's do that. Let's let's start now, then. Uh, if you were uh, if you were in my class now, I would have you turn into page six or seven in the booklet, on which I have photocopied uh, a handful of the questions that my students from last year did on their language investigation. And so, what you need to do is read through them, highlight three that you think are interesting for some particular reason, and think about you know what are the benefits of doing that as an as an investigation. What seem to be the strengths? What might be some of the difficulties as well? So what challenges might you come across and how could you resolve those particular challenges? So as an example, I've got in front of me here the second one, which says, how do the Strictly Dancing judges use language in different ways to represent themselves and the dance performances? I'll read that again. How do the Strictly Dancing judges use language in different ways to represent themselves and the dance performances? Now that is a beautiful language investigation. Um, it's uh, the, the data is straightforward to collect. You know, you get yourself on BBC iPlayer or YouTube, uh, you find yourself some interesting pieces of language, you transcribe it, uh, you'll be able to get hold of lots and lots of the data. So there's not an issue with the length of the data there. And uh, you'll have interesting comparisons to be made because you've got three or four different judges. You might be looking at the language of Bruno compared with the language of Craig Revel Hall uh, and the female uh, judges as well. So there's some nice comparisons that can be made between those different judges. Uh, it's speech. So the language is going to be interesting. Um, it's going to be quite original feeling. So, you know, you won't be able to get on the Internet and find all sorts of learned academic analyses of that. So you're going to be producing something that is completely unique. Um, a challenge on it is going to be how are you going to analyze some of the prosodic and paralinguistic features that are going on, by which I mean prosodic features, the variations in tone and pitch and stress and volume, which are going to play such an important part in the communication of the meanings. And the paralinguistic features, meaning the body language, OK, so there's a challenge for you. That's that's going to be quite difficult for you because they're going to impact pragmatically on the meanings in quite decisive ways. OK, so there's an example of talking through one of the investigations. You have a look through the remainder of them and do the same. So think about what are the benefits and also some of the problems and issues. OK, we move on to the next bit then. So if you've got the, the, the booklet in front of you, what I've put down here, and it's on my next slide, are examples of data, different sort of categories of data. And what are the sort of possibilities that are out there? So what, uh, what specific bits of data could you get which fall into these categories? So let's move into this now. So write down examples of data linked to the following linguistic areas. So online communication, for example, well, there are all sorts of data that you could go off and collect. You could collect, for example, tweets, tweets done by various comedians who are all talking about a specific topic. Um, you could look at comments that people, members of the public uh, leave in response to certain YouTube clips. They would make interesting comparisons. Uh, you could collect text messages. Uh, done by different age groups. So for example, different members of your family, from your grandparents to your parents to you, you know, so you've got, let's say, three different layers of generations there. And are there significant differences uh, in those text messages? 
which link in with people's ages. So there you've got three examples of online communication, I, language and technology, where you could collect some interesting data. So what I would do there is I'd pause the video and I would go through each of the, the other, the rest on this slide and think what specific bits of data could you collect? Okay, so I'm assuming that you've done that. Now let's have a think about uh, mode. Okay, so on page nine, uh, yeah, just on page nine, we've got a sheet that, that says working with data. And this is getting you to think about the benefits, challenges, and possible solutions to those challenges of the three different modes. And by which, by which I mean unplanned speech being one mode, writing being a second mode, and then blended mode, like hybrid texts being a third mode. Okay, so first of all, let's think about speech and what would be the benefits of doing a language investigation that looks at speech. And when I mean speech, I mean something like that on the top of the slide there. So the language of two different driving instructors, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? So in your uh, driving uh, lesson to be recording your instructor, and then making a comparison with a different driving instructor to see what kind of strategies, what linguistic strategies are being used by these instructors. Okay, so what are the benefits of using speech? Well, what you're collecting is very, very original data. It's primary data. It's never been collected or analyzed before. So when you're doing it, you feel like you're doing something completely unique. Um, Speech is infinitely varied. It's varied, it's dynamic. Uh, whenever we're analyzing speech, we're, also, we're always thinking about human psychology. Uh, we're always thinking about what does this say about us as individuals? So speech is fascinating from that respect. Um, speech enables you to write, draw transcripts. Um, it's a quite laborious and time consuming thing, but what it demonstrates to your examiner is that you've got good mechanical linguistic skills and that you're able to integrate these into your methodology. So it enables you to show transcribing skills. It also enables you to analyze phonology. Um, it may well be that you want to use, for example, the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, to investigate aspects of regional accent. Or maybe you're listening to the language of your two-year-old cousin and you're using uh, IPA there in order to deconstruct the kind of uh, phonological features that are going on in their speech. Okay, um, speech also enables you to write about discourse. So you can look at conversational analysis. You can apply, for example, good old Grice, Grice's conversational maxims. Uh, and the other advantage on speech is that it enables you to think about some of the social linguistic theory that you would have learned about last year on language diversity in areas such as language and age and language and gender, accent and dialect. So, for example, on gender, you could be applying some of the D's, you know, the deficit, dominance, difference, diversity, all of those different models. OK, so there's a lot of. Uh, benefits in you choosing speech. What might be some of the uh, limitations or difficulties of speech? Pause the video there and have a think. Here are a few that I came up with. Uh, first of all, the idea that transcription is time consuming. Uh, it does take a long time. Uh, secondly, sometimes it's quite difficult because if you're listening to a clip on YouTube, some of the bits may be inaudible, so it's not necessarily completely clear. Uh, if you're collecting primary data, let's say, for example, you've decided, yes, I am going to record my driving instructor, then you're actually going to have to get permission from the speaker. So there are issues there in uh, getting permission. There's also issues on the same one on of, of overcoming what's called observer's paradox, which I think psychologists would call the, the Hawthorne technique or something like that, the Hawthorne effect. And this is this idea that people actually change the way they speak when they know they're being recorded. So how can you go about collecting naturalistic speech when people know that they're being recorded? 
So there are various ways, sneaky ways around that. I suppose one way that you could do is, which I'm not sure is completely ethical, is that you could make the recording and then when the recording has complete, then ask the permission of the person to use it. Um, I'm not sure how ethical that is, going around recording people subversively. <laughs> um, another way of doing it is to tell them beforehand that you are going to be recording them, uh, but to disregard like the first section of your recording when the person is going to be uh, most um, influenced by the fact that they're being recorded because people's guard naturally dissolves over time. So it may well be that after 15 minutes of recording that you're getting something that approximates to naturalistic data. Okay, so you're gonna to have to be careful think, if you're collecting primary data, how you are gonna overcome observer's paradox. Uh, the other thing, which is what we talked about on this Strictly Dancing Judges one is that it's actually difficult to represent those things, prosodic and paralinguistic features. So you're going to have to somehow demonstrate that they are significant features. Um, the other thing on speech is that the full situational context may not be immediately obvious. You know, you've you've collected your your YouTube clip, um, but actually, what's the situation that's surrounding that clip may not be completely apparent. So that is a, a possible challenge on speech. Right, now let's turn our attention to writing, by which I mean something like, you know, the language of Cosmopolitan magazine front covers. So pause the video there and think what are some of the benefits in doing a language investigation that's on written texts. Here are some examples of the benefits that I thought of. The data collection on writing can be very quick. Uh, you know, if you're doing about the language of Cosmopolitan magazine front covers, presumably you'd be able to get onto Google Images very quickly and you'd be able to collect the data fast. So that can be an advantage. Um, it would enable you to analyze graphological features. If, for example, you're looking at I don't know, stories written by year three primary school students, then it may well be that the graphological features, like, for example, the non standard spellings there, that would be a very straightforward thing for you to be analysing using your existing uh, research knowledge about that from the previous topic on CLD. OK, um, also, if you're doing written text, that enables you to investigate old texts. Uh, we've had some fantastic language investigations in the past where people have gone back to old texts. Like, for example, I remember somebody uh, making a comparison between uh, John Milton's uh, pass passages from John Milton's Paradise Lost, where they're talking about Adam and Eve in the garden and comparing it that with the 17th century King James Bible. OK, so it, it written text enables you to go back to texts through time uh, and therefore show understanding of language change. Now, I know that's difficult for you because we haven't studied language change yet. That is a pleasure that awaits you in January and February and March. But certainly there is lots of information in the in the textbook there to get you going on language change. Uh, the other advantage on uh, writing about writing is that it enables you to deconstruct some of the more sophisticated language features, i.e. the literary devices that are going on. Uh, writing tends to be more crafted and therefore it gives you the, the, the freedom to be uh, looking at, let's say, the figurative devices that, that writers are using. Um, and the other thing is a straightforward thing that basically m most writing is in the public domain and therefore it doesn't require any kind of permission for you to use. So it's unlike you going off and trying to record your driving instructor. You know, the text is out there in the public domain, so there are no permission issues. Let's have a think about some of the, the challenges in doing the, an investigation on the written mode. Um, Older text, uh, depending on how far you go back, if going back again to that, those 17th century texts, some of the older texts might be actually quite difficult to decipher, particularly if you're looking at old writing, where a lot of the graphological lettering features are different from current day. So older text might be quite difficult to, to deconstruct in that way. Uh, the other thing about writing is that the full context of the text might not be obvious. So, again, if you're going in the past, 
then there are limitations to what you know about the implied audience and the social context, and that may be a, a limiting factor. Um, so if you've got a written text, it may require you to do quite a lot of research about the writer and their intentions. Okay, so those are some of the challenges. Now let's think about blended mode text. Okay, so an example of that would be uh, Donald Trump's tweets. Imagine spending two months with Donald Trump on his tweets. So uh, that would be classified as a kind of hybrid blended mode text because although it's written down, it has features of conversational English. What are the benefits of doing an investigation on that data? Well, it's exciting because what you're basically looking at is new modes of communication. If you think of tweets, you know, tw Twitter has only been around relatively short time, something like 15 years. So uh, it's a new mode of communication and it's demonstrating the latest linguistic trends. So anything that's associated with new technology is going to be interesting because it may well be that you've got completely new discourses being created by that discourse, by that uh, technology. Um, it doesn't require obtaining permission because Donald is putting his tweets out there for the world to read. Um, it's the best of both worlds because you can analyze some of the graphological features that are happening. You know, you can be looking at Donald Trump's spelling or punctuation or font uh, styles or sizes, but you could also be looking at other things like his grammatical choices and his lexical choices and his pragmatic choices. So um, it, it enables you to draw upon a wide range of different language levels, um, which is basically the same as what Matt said there. And so the challenge is there. Yeah, I put on there that data collection might be difficult, but it's probably no more difficult than collecting any other data, whether it be spoken data or written data. OK, so there are lots of there are lots of benefits and possible challenges to each of your choices. Um, in terms of the data, then, where is it going to be put? It's going to be if you've got your language, if you've got your booklet in front of you, look in your look at the back of the booklet, because there you've got examples of the appendix where the data has been put. Um, so if, for example, you're looking at this one, this is the one about uh, Piers Morgan. Uh, and Susanna Reid, and you can see they've got pages and pages of here of transcription that this student has done. Uh, you will need to be following the basic conventions of uh, uh, transcripts. Uh, they are spelled out in detail in the textbook on pages 241 to 243. Uh, the key thing is that you're not using punctuation in a conventional way, so you're not using full stops or commas or capital letters in conventional ways. And you're using brackets in order to denote pauses. So all of the details of that are spelled out in the textbook on page 241 to 243. Um, the data needs to be word processed. Uh, even if you're taking written data where you're thinking, well, I can just photocopy this, there are certainly advantages to word processing it. Uh, so that it will enable you to work with it more easily because you're going to be taking chunks out of your data. So I would be word processing it. In terms of how much you need, as I said on the previous video, something like six to eight sides of data is probably about right. The key thing is you need enough data to allow you to identify linguistic patterns. So in this way, it's different to an essay. In an essay, you might be honing in on some single isolated features, but you're not doing that in a language investigation. You're looking at patterns that are going across an amount of data. So you do need enough, enough of the stuff to enable you to do that. And when you get to construct your methodology, which is later on, you'll need to justify how your data was selected, collected, presented and analyzed. So do make sure that, you know, in collecting your data, in working with your data, that you've really thought carefully about the advantages and the issues of your chosen data. OK, so um, this is what if I were you at this stage, this is what I'd be doing. I would be going to the booklet. I would be if you've got an idea for your language investigation, 
I would be filling in the uh, filling in the details there on page 10, sharing it with me on Google Classroom so that I can have a read through your suggestion. And then once your idea has been approved, then you need to start researching, selecting and collecting that data. And that might take you quite a long time. Uh, if it's written data that you can get hold of very quickly, then the next thing for you to be doing is to be annotating it. Um, and if you look in the booklet on pages 12, 13, yes, pages 12 and 13, we have the kind of key terms that you should be very familiar with by now. But on page 12 and 13, these are all the kind of AO1 linguistic terms that you will need to be applying to your data.